Apple's new investments in artificial intelligence, Elon Musk versus OpenAI, and ERP trends from a tech pioneer. Those are just a few of the topics we're going to cover here in episode 162 of Transformation Ground Control. Welcome to Transformation Ground Control. Ground Control. The podcast that covers everything related to digital transformation. This podcast features technology agnostic and international discussions related to digital strategy, software selection, implementation, change management, business process optimization, and everything else you need to know to make your digital transformation project successful. Whether you're embarking on an ERP implementation, supply chain transformation, or any other business or digital transformation, this podcast is for you. You. Now, here's your host, Eric Kimberling. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 162. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach the third stage of digital transformation success. And I'm here with my co-host, Darian Fiakuski. Darian, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to have you. Great to have you, the audience, here today. Uh, new episodes every Wednesday. You can find us at transformationgroundcontrol.com. This podcast covers everything related to digital transformation, so excited for today's episode. We're going to cover a, a few things. We're going to get into uh, Apple's new investments in AI, and uh, they've already been investing in AI, but as we'll discuss, um, they are also redirecting or diverting some of the money they were investing in electric vehicles or diverting that to artificial intelligence, so we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll also talk about Elon Musk versus OpenAI, and uh, we're also going to get to some audience questions. Actually, we'll start off with the audience questions. I'm, I'm going out of order here today. It's a, it's a rough start already. Uh, we're we're going to start with uh, audience questions from social media, then we'll get into Apple investments in AI, then Elon Musk versus OpenAI. And then speaking of AI and uh, emerging technology trends, we're going to have a guest on who I'm very excited about, uh, Jan Bon, who is the founder of Bon, which is one of the original ERP software vendors from the late 70s into the 90s. It was a very prominent ERP software vendor. He's up to other stuff these days, and he's still very close to the enterprise tech space. So we're going to talk to him about trends in ERP, as well as uh, just sort of how he got to where he got today and his history in the ERP space, but as well as where we're headed in the future with some of the trends and some of the uh, shakeups and disruptions that are happening in the ERP and enterprise technology space. So be sure to stick around for that. That'll be Jan Bon here on later in the show. But before we get to that, uh, Darian, what are some of these uh, questions that you've got from our audience here today? Yeah, lots of good questions from our audience today. The first one is, for companies considering a best of breed approach, what is the impact on total cost of ownership compared to a single ERP solution? Good question. Um, I, I suppose it, uh, it depends on how good of a fit either solution is, whether it's the best of breed or single ERP. Um, on one hand, ERP software, traditional integrated ERP systems, can save you some money because you don't have to do as much integration and as much um, tying together different systems. Um, although I will say you have to be careful because you still are doing a lot of integration even between modules and um, a lot of these software vendors have bought third-party providers that they have to integrate with anyway, um, but they have all these different systems to help you hopefully buy from one single vendor. And uh, we're going to talk about vendor lock-in actually later in this episode with Jan Bon, and, and even after that we'll talk more about vendor lock-in as well. Uh, but ERP vendors want to lock you in, and they'll make you think that they have a fully integrated solution, but oftentimes they have third-party systems or even their own modules take a lot of work to, to integrate. So I think sometimes this cost savings there is a bit overstated, um, but but that's the way ERP softwares will position it. ERP software vendors will position it, but there is some cost savings potentially of not having to integrate multiple systems. Best of breed, on the other hand, yes, you might have to spend a little bit more time and money integrating multiple systems. It might be a little bit harder to manage. There might be questions about single source of truth and all that sort of stuff. But generally speaking, if you do it right, best of breed can be a better functional fit, which means it's going to be easier to deploy. It means your users or your, your, your people and your business processes are going to be less resistant to the new technology. And chances are pretty high that you're going to get more business value out of best of, best of breed scenario. So even if it costs you slightly more potentially, which I would argue may not be the case, but even if it did cost you slightly more, chances are fairly high that you're going to get a better ROI because you have higher business benefits potentially. And again, this all assumes that 
you find the right functional solutions for different parts of your business, and then you, you effectively tie them together. Of course, if you find technology that doesn't fit your business either way, whether it's single ERP or best of breed, that's going to cost you a lot and create a lot of risk. So uh, the assumption here is that you find the right software and, and you do, do your due diligence behind that. But um, honestly speaking, though, I don't know that there's a huge um, advantage to ERP systems. Um, in many cases, we see best of breed outperforming in terms of ROI. And actually, we're going to come back to that best of breed concept uh, among other trends that we'll talk about the on bond later in this episode. We'll also talk about composable ERP and microservices and things that are sort of like best of breed or at least alternatives, traditional ERP. And we'll talk about where the business value lies in those sorts of deployments too. So that's a long way of saying that uh, it depends. Yeah, it all depends. That's a great take, Eric. What about this second question from our audience? It is, I think AI will assist consultants in implementation, purpose configurations, faster testing, analyze processes, and propose more efficient ones. He also thinks that AI will replace 80% of ERP, and he's wondering if you agree or disagree with this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity for AI to make implementations more effective, even if you just look at um, writing writing the code. You know, if you've got to do some development work and you've got to write code or you've got to do some sort of custom reports or you've got to do some sort of configuration, you could be using AI to do a lot of that stuff. And right now, you have a lot of highly paid people, even if you offshore it or you find a low cost country to do that work for you, you're still paying humans to do that manual work. And I don't know that we're anywhere close to having AI completely replace humans in implementations. In fact, I think we're nowhere near that. I don't know if we'll ever get there, to be honest, but it, there is an opportunity for us to cut out some of that low value type stuff in implementations because, you know, we spend so much time and money implementing technology, but we don't spend enough time and money on the operational and the people human side of things. So if we could use AI to fast track some of this technology stuff that we get bogged down in, now we can focus our human efforts on validating, first of all, what we get from AI on the technology side, but more importantly, focusing on the, the people and business process side of it to ensure that the, the transformation itself is successful, not just you know deployment of a new tool. Yeah, that makes sense. And now I'm excited to get into our topics of the day, what are which are going to be about Apple and Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. AI, you know, you just asked the question about AI, and uh, that's going to be the theme in our hot topics here. We're going to talk about um, Apple's investments in artificial intelligence, and more specifically, they're, they're cutting uh, an electric vehicle initiative to take that money and those resources to redeploy to AI. And then we're also going to talk about Elon Musk versus open AI. And uh, this is our attempt to try and get Elon Musk on the show. We'll be candid. Uh, even though it's an interesting topic, we're also trying to get him on the show. So uh, we figure the more times we mention him, eventually he'll have to listen and he'll hear us saying that we want Elon Musk on the show. So that's part of the self-serving part of it, but it's also interesting too. And then later, uh, after we get to those hot topics, we'll also get into uh, our interview, our main interview with uh, Jan Bond, who's the founder of Bond Software, which is now owned by Infor. And uh, we're going to have him on the show to talk about the history of sort of Bond and the ERP space in general and how the ERP space has evolved. But more importantly, we're going to talk about where the ERP space is headed, some of the trends and alternatives to traditional ERP vendors, some of the risks associated with that. Certainly AI is going to be one of the things we talk about there. We'll also get into composable ERP microservices, all kinds of other stuff there. So uh, great stuff that we're excited to share with you. So stick around. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, Contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 162. My name is Eric Kimberling here at Darien Fiakuski. 
And uh, the show is sponsored by Third Stage Consulting and produced by Major Tom Productions. Thank you for being here today. And uh, Third Stage Consulting is an independent digital transformation consulting firm that helps clients select and implement ERP software as well as digital transformation technologies. Um, you can learn more at thirdstage-consulting.com. And, of course, Third Stage is the company that I'm the CEO of. So um, thank you for checking them out in advance. So um, new episodes of the show every Wednesday. You can find us at transformationgroundcontrol.com. Um, and uh, you can also find the past episodes there as well. So, uh, Darian, you've got some interesting articles here involving AI. What, what do you have in store for us here? Yeah, so the first one talks about Apple's move to cancel electric vehicles and ending their decade-long saga with that and moving that into AI. So, for example, the giant tech Apple has recently announced they're officially stepping back from electric vehicles and redirecting focus into the rapidly developing AI field. This pivot reflects a strategic realignment prioritizing immediate technology competitiveness over a long-term explorations into the automotive sector. Despite the allure of integrating consumer experiences with vehicles, Apple is honing in on its core and acknowledging the fierce battle for dominance in the AI landscape. Some questions that I have for you about this, Eric, is considering Apple's historical success with integrating consumer experiences how significant is their shift away from exploring vehicle integration? I think it's super interesting and telling of where they see the future. Um, you know, I've, I've read recently that electric vehicle, the electric vehicle market in general is sort of leveled off. It's not growing as fast as it was recently and also not as fast as many had expected throughout the world. So I think that's part of it is you have so many uh, startups, you know, obviously Tesla is not a startup anymore, but Tesla sort of dominated that space in many parts of the world. And all the major automotive manufacturers that are sort of the incumbent manufacturers all have electric vehicle offerings. Um, but at the same time, that, that market's not growing as much. I don't know if it's just because the initial bump in adoption as a result of, of government tax incentives and things like that, if that is sort of taken its course and now, you know, we're not getting to that main mainstream level of adoption. I'm not sure, but it does make you wonder though, does that mean Apple won't have a place in that consumer facing side of it to your point? Um, or does that put them further behind? Or maybe they just see something that we don't see, which is there's just not the opportunity that they thought there was. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I do think it's also telling that they see AI as being so important in the future, because obviously, you know, that's where they're choosing to spend their their time and money. And I think that there's a lot to be said there because Apple of all companies you know, maybe Microsoft or Google are kind of in the same boat here, but with the high level of adoption and penetration in the market of all of Apple devices, you know, phones and watches and iTunes and watching podcasts on Apple Podcasts or listening to podcasts on Apple Podcasts, all that stuff, I think points to the fact that there's an opportunity for them to leverage AI at scale in a way that most organizations can't, unless you're, like I said, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, potentially, um, at least at that consumer level. So, I think that maybe maybe that's a bigger part of it, and they just see more opportunity in their existing channels and technologies that they can now use AI to drive more, whatever it is they're going to drive, more advertising revenue or more device adoption or whatever it is. But it does make you wonder what, where are they going to – that, does that mean they're going to miss out on the whole EV movement? Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my thought there. Yeah, super interesting. And to touch back on your point for the tech giants in your view – what does Apple's strategic pivot tell us about the challenges and priorities facing tech giants in today's evolving technology environment? Well, I think that's the key is it's, it's constantly evolving. It's changing fast. I mean, it's it's changing so fast now, like with AI and there's so much competition in AI now, even electric vehicles. I'm, I'm surprised at how many companies are fighting in that space right now. So um, I think, you know, it's it's sort of like a an arms race you know, who, who can build the best AI mousetrap and who can best leverage mass amounts of data um, and, and get that AI to add value at scale, um, which, you know, if you think about it, it's hard to do if you're a small AI startup, if you don't have data and you don't have connection points to, you know, all these different points of data, like the way Apple does or the way Amazon does or, you know, whoever the big consumer tech provider might be. Um, so yeah, that's that. Those are my my thoughts. There is, I think that that uh, 
that just points to the fact that AI is growing, obviously, or else Apple wouldn't be investing in it. And B, it's changing very quickly. And they saw something a while back with EV, the EV market that they liked, and now they see something that they don't like as much as they like AI. So that seems like a pretty fast cycle that's faster than it's been in the past. For sure. And I want to touch back on your point you made as well about uh, Apple has all the data and all the different phones, watches, people listening on all their different apps, everything like that. What do you think, what are some AI things they could implement that would maybe help people that are currently using Apple products? Yeah, great question. Um, Well, one comes to mind would be in one thing that we didn't mention so far as Apple Pay. You know, Apple has a, a payment processing platform called Apple Pay, which personally I love. I use it all the time because it's so fast and easy and I always forget my credit card or lose my credit cards, which drives my wife crazy because I'm constantly losing them because um, I'll leave them somewhere when I pay with a card. So I just try not to use it. Anyway, that's beside the point. But <laughs> but uh, what I'd say is, you know, you look at Apple Pay and look at all that consumer data you're getting on everything I do every day where I spend money. Apple has a pretty broad history of my my consumer b- buying behavior. And so if there's a way to advertise, you know, to target advertising at me based on what they're seeing, you know, on the, on the, on the payment processing side, AI would be a great way to say, you know, here's, here's something that might be appealing. Now, you know, companies like Amazon have been doing this for a long time. They already use AI and algorithms to predict, you know, when you go log into Amazon or Alibaba does the same thing for people listening that might use Alibaba instead. Um, Temu, I think there's that new one from, uh, it's not new, but it's penetrating our market in North America, uh, the Chinese-based uh, sort of Amazon where it's a low-cost product provider. Anyway, those lo- those large consumer e-commerce brands have always done this, but I think there's an opportunity now to extend that AI mentality to things like Apple, you know, with Apple Pay. Um, certainly when you look at all the things we do on our phones, you know, our browsing behavior, what apps we use. I mean, Apple has to know a lot about us and there has to be some sort of profile that you have that I have based on everything you're doing on your phone. And so there's just ways I would imagine to target advertising uh, to them, to, to sell them additional product services that are either direct from Apple or, you know, through a partner that's advertising. Um, so I think there's a lot they could do there to really extend their revenue base based on that. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it's a super interesting thing that they're doing. I think it's probably a good move because everybody else is getting into AI. So makes sense for Apple too, like we talked about. But I'm really excited to talk about our next subject, which kind of goes with AI, but it is about the must versus open AI. Interesting. Yeah. Nice to hear about this. Yeah. So this article talks about how Elon Musk initiated legal action against open AI and its CEO, Sam Altman in late February 2024, so just recently. This lawsuit is centered around Musk's allegation that OpenAI OpenAI has deviated deviated from its founding mission of developing artificial intelligence for the broader benefit of humanity and is now pursuing a profit-driven approach, particularly in partnership with Microsoft. This case underscores tensions between Musk's vision for AI development and the direction of OpenAI open AI has taken, especially regarding the accessibility and use for AI technologies like GPT-4. For some questions for you, Eric, about this is, the lawsuit highlights a critical debate in tech, how should AI de- be developed and shared? Yeah, that's a that's super interesting, because I remember um, a while back, I think it was probably mid-2023, over the, over the summer of 2023, um, Elon Musk wrote a op- sort of an open letter to the industry where he said, Basically, he thought all AI development should be put on pause while we as a human race and a regulatory, all the regulatory bodies throughout the world sort of assess the impact of AI on, on society. And I think he's been sort of an alarmist. Uh, I, I'm not saying he's right or wrong, but he's been somewhat of an alarmist about AI and uh, some of the negative fallout, the unintended consequences of AI. So, um, you know, I know, I don't know how serious people took that. I mean, people do take it, Elon Musk pretty seriously in general. Obviously, he's one of the most influential people in the world. But I think pe- there were some people that thought maybe he was using that for personal gain to help him catch up in his own AI initiatives to catch up to where OpenAI and some of these other providers already are. Um, I don't know how founded that criticism is or was, but I think that might have undermined or diluted some of his messaging or his concern around it. And so 
when I look at this here now, I wonder, well, is it because he's he's struggling? You know, OpenAI has some sort of unfair advantage and, and he doesn't have that sort of um, pole position or whatever you want to call it in the AI space. Um, I don't know. And I, actually, I don't even know if that's true, by the way. He may have more of a leg up in AI than I, than I think. I mean, obviously, you know, we talk about consumer facing products a moment ago in electric cars. Obviously, he owns Tesla or started Tesla. There's a lot of consumer data being captured through uh, devices and internet of things in the vehicles that Tesla produces. So maybe there's, you know, AI stuff that I just don't know about. I don't use it. I don't drive a Tesla, so I don't know how, how it works. But um, anyway, but I think there's questions about, you know, is it, is he just trying to get sort of a level playing field so he can compete better? Or is there more of a true, um, what's it, what's the word I'm looking for? Societal concern that he has. I suspect it's probably maybe a bit of both. Um, but I do think that it's, it raises a broader question of, are we as a society and our governments throughout the world truly prepared for the displacement that AI is likely to cause? Um, I don't think it's going to cause necessarily famine and mass unemployment and things like that, but I do think it's going to, at the very least, shift the way the workforce looks. Um, people, Some jobs are going to get automated, new jobs are going to get created, just like you know when robotics hit the market and when computers and automation started to take hold, it just it disrupted the workforce. Um, but I think the difference here is AI is evolving so quickly and the mass adoption of AI has happened so much faster than any other technology I've seen because it was just like a year ago, just a little bit over a year ago when ChatGPT really caught on and all of a sudden it was part of pop culture and mainstream day-to-day -day stuff, so much so that you know TV shows were talking about AI. And so we all kind of know about ChatGPT and AI now. Um, and that that's a pretty fast adoption. I mean, it feels like years ago that ChatGPT was a thing or started to become a thing, but it was just, you know, maybe 14, 15 months ago when it really caught on. Um, so anyway, I, I, I think it's worth looking at and I think it's worth um, thinking about, you know, what is, you know, does, should open AI have that, that sort of unfair advantage when they are becoming more of a profit driven company partnering with Microsoft. Uh, but it goes to show how important AI is going to be now and in the future. Yeah, those are some great points. Another question is in this lawsuit, it highlights concerns over AI ethics and distribution of AI technology. How do you think this is legal challenge could influence the future partnerships between tech giants and AI research organizations? Uh, yeah, that's that's hard to answer. Um, I have mixed feelings, I suppose, on it. I mean, on one hand, I think that it's important to let the market and capitalism drive innovation and adoption of AI and use of AI and things like that. But on the other hand, back to the previous point about the unintended consequences of AI, if it's true or if the feeling is universal that AI could have a negative impact on societies throughout the world and productivity and uh, standards of living or just, you know, overall happiness, I guess you'd say, um, then then the question becomes, should, should governments throughout the world start to step in and, and regulate? And I think they're already starting to in some cases. Um, I'm not saying that's a good thing necessarily, but it might be necessary. The only problem then is that, you know, you start to get into, you'll start to get into uh, winners and losers, you know, ge uh, geographically or nationally, globally, you know, some governments, you know, might regulate so much or, or protect consumers so much from AI that maybe it's a good thing, but maybe it's a bad thing compared to what another country's government does. So that's the only downside in AI, I guess, is you know, it's sort of like, uh, maybe it's sort of a little bit like electricity or water, you know, you, you need to make money distributing those things, but they be, they're sort of necessities. And of course, you'll die without, you know, water. So of course, we need water. We don't necessarily need AI. It's a nice thing to have potentially, but it does make you wonder over time, you know, does that become like a necessity, if you will, uh, for for different countries, uh, much in the way like in the in the US and in parts of Europe, I know, too, there's there's regulatory movements towards giving people the rights to to cheap internet and Wi-Fi. Um, you know, people aren't going to die without it. Probably not. But um, but there is there is a movement or a school of thought that says that everyone should have a right to that. There's probably going to be schools of thought or movements uh, in government bodies throughout the world that says everyone has a right to benefit from AI and everyone has a right to be protected from the downside of AI. I'd l I'd actually love to hear in the comments, you know, what the audience thinks about this, because I'm, I don't have a strong opinion either way, but love to hear what your thoughts are on AI. Do we, do we all have a right to it? Should governments be regulating it? Should we keep it profit driven? Is it some sort of hybrid? I'd love to hear sort of what, what your thoughts are on that in the chat. Yeah, that's a good point. I 
that kind of plays into my next question, hearing what other people's thoughts are. But for this question, what do you see? What do you foresee incidents like this lawsuit, for example, impact, impacting public trust in AI? And what measures do you believe can be taken to build a transparent and accountable AI ecosystem that garners social trust? Well, well, I suppose part of it is, uh, you know, transparency of data, because AI could be a good thing, but if the data that's being fed into AI is is flawed or biased in some way, then that's gonna that's gonna um, undermine public trust in AI. So I'm not sure what to do. I, that's where I think that, in some ways, you want the government to leave politics out of it, because I mean, the minute you start injecting or infusing data points potentially into AI models that are biased that says, you know, for example, if I were to go into ChatGPT and say, um, you know, who would be the best candidate for prime minister of the UK? Let's just say that's just a random thing. I, I would I, I would have no reason to put that in ChatGPT. But if I did, let's just say, and I'm trying to just educate myself, inform myself on how I should vote in the next UK election for prime minister. Um, you know, what if what if politicians somehow feed in information just like they do now with the media or on the Internet or whatever? And and then does do people start to think that AI is not a truly objective, universal sort of a tool? And now people are using it for their own self gain and that sort of thing, or even advertising. You know, if you have advertisers from big corporations that can afford to influence data models to where if I go in and, and search AI, ask, you know, what's the safest uh, um, I don't know, the safest car to drive and advertisers or big company names sort of bias the data and put in internal studies that aren't validated, for example, put that, you know, somehow if AI is using that, those biased tools or, or biased data sets, now suddenly AI is not reliable and trustworthy. So I guess it's sort of like Google, you know, Google had the same problem with advertisers and you don't always find what you want on Google. Sometimes it's biased, sometimes it's not. Um, but I'd say people generally trust Google despite that. So I don't know how founded it is, but I think we do have to be careful of it because I think people maybe view AI as something that's more of a, a true arbitrator of truth versus Google. You're just looking for articles and maybe maybe blogs and different opinions. AI has the ability to potentially turn biased opinions into fact. So that, that, that I don't have a good quite, a good answer for that, but I think that's the risk you run. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Well, this was some great conversation today for the social topics and the articles. I'm super excited to dive in and learn from Jan Bon today. So, yeah, absolutely. He's uh, Jan Bon is someone who's never been on this podcast. I've actually never met Jan Bon until today. I'll meet him for the first time. Um, so um, excited for this, and it's someone I should have met. Honestly, being in the space for so long, I studied his. Uh, I studied his software. Bon was the first software that I was exposed to when I was getting my my uh, MBA, I took uh, some operational improvement and IT related classes while I was getting my MBA. And, and I remember professors talking about Bond and that's sort of how I learned about ERP was through Bond. So it's it's uh, quite the honor to have Jan Bond on the show, uh, who's the founder of Bond and has since gone on to do other things besides Bond. And we'll, we'll talk about both. We'll talk about his history at Bond, but we'll also talk about the future uh, of the ERP software space and the enterprise tech space in general. So excited to have him on the show. We're going to bring you on, on the show here in just a moment, but first we'll take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. I'm excited to share our newly released 2024 Digital Enterprise Operations Report. This free download is available on the Third Stage website at thirdstage-consulting.com. This report is truly packed full of technology independent and agnostic insights for your project to ensure that you're strategically optimized for success. Download your copy today with the QR code in front of me or visit our website for more details. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 162. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Darian Fiakuski. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. The show is sponsored by Third Stage Consulting and produced by Major Tom Productions. So thank you for being here today. Excited for our next guest, Jan Bon, who's the CEO of Bon, or he was the CEO of Bon. He founded the company Bon, was the CEO, uh, left the company, and then went on to start two other uh, companies, uh, 
throughout his career, and he's going to be on the show to talk about both the past and the history of ERP software, but more importantly, we'll spend most of the time in the conversation talking about the future of ERP software and enterprise tech and where it's headed overall and some of the trends he sees in the space, which is really a unique perspective because it's, it's rare that you get to hear from a visionary and a pioneer all at the same time, someone who's been in the space for a really long time, but has constantly been and continues to be a visionary in the space. So usually, usually you can find one or the other, but usually you can't find someone who is both a pioneer and a, and a visionary going forward uh, many years later. So uh, with all, all that being said, Jan, welcome to the show. My pleasure, Eric. Thanks pleasure. for inviting me. Absolutely. It's uh, it's amazing that you and I have never had an interview after all this time. We've, you, we've yeah. both been in the space for a long time, and, and this is the first chance we've had to have an interview. So I'm, uh, I'll am i be honest, I'm honored to have you on the show, and uh, you're, you're sort of a legend in the ERP software space. And I have to share a couple quick stories, if you don't mind, real quick, before I ask you to introduce yourself a little bit more, Jan. But for the audience's sake, uh, a couple quick things. Uh, first of all, when I was in graduate school, um, I had a professor who was obsessed with Bond. He'd always talk about Bond. He would he would actually demo Bond for us in our classes to show us what Bond could do and how it related to operational improvement and business process improvement and automation. And this is back in the 90s, of course, and uh, Bond was obviously a very prominent uh, system at the time. So Bond was actually the first ERP system that I ever heard of and was at all familiar with. So uh, that's why it's even more exciting to have you here on the show, because I've just I've known about Bond since I first learned about ERP. So uh, that that is an honor. And then uh, secondly, I have to share this with the audience. Uh, as we were preparing for this interview, just in the 15 minutes before Jan came on the show here today, um, we were just talking, kind of preparing the questions. And I learned a ton of stuff just in that prep conversation. So I'm very excited. I think you're going to learn a lot from Jan here today. Um, so uh, please ask any questions you have. So with that all being said, I know that's a long preamble, uh, Jan, but if you don't mind, maybe just just tell us about yourself. Tell us a little bit about you and your your background. Oh, I'm 77 years old and traveling long, only 45 years on the enterprise journey and starting Bahn from scratch, being 20 years there. And then I quit because I came to the conclusion after 20 years with 5,000 people that I felt a little bit obsolete because everything we built was not built for the browser. And I quit and uh, I call it burn my shifts behind me, start again. And I invested my money in the cloud. And we built with a BPM, Business Process Management layer. I invested in WebEx and top tier, 100 millions uh, of dollars. And I saw that a little first in the slipstream of Bahn. But then I learned that disruptive innovation has no chance in an institute. And I'm being more an entrepreneur than an investor. Need fun. And always I traveled on roads where no one was before me. And I started again in BPM and we built end-to-end -end processes. But BPM was too complicated, even mm. for the CIOs. They did not understand it real, but I learned a lot. And then I quit again. BPM, then my chorus company became part of Open Text. And I focus in what we call the knowledge worker. The API is connecting dots. Maybe uh, in BPM, the browser is connecting the dots. But now you go to API, and then you go to what we call big data, machine learning, the content, containerization, the microservices. Mm. And you do it no longer for the enterprise because the enterprise moved downstream from the from the silo to the processes on the internet. And now you go to internet 2.0, 3.0 to the knowledge worker for the job to be done. Now, that's more my journey. That's very interesting. So I have to ask you this, just as sort of a uh, one of the things you said that's very interesting is you said um, that you left Bonn and sort of burned the ships behind you. When was this that you left Bonn? This was in the late age. 1998. 1998. So 1998, you leave Bonn, and part of your concern was that it wasn't cloud-based or internet-based, and you wanted to create something that was, that was web-based. Yeah. This is, and just to put it in context for those that may not remember this, but 1998, the cloud was not that, that wasn't a thing. That wasn't uh, yeah. as widely accepted as it is today. How did you know, or why did you think at the time that the cloud? I was early. I was an early bird in Webex. Uh, there was no one, uh, we have a small company, Silicon Valley. I helped them in the IPO process. I invested uh, 50 million, 60 million later or more. And they and I allowed them to do a freemium. And even Zoom was not there when, when I invested in the WebEx because they, did, I, they, did, they sold it to Cisco. And then Eric uh, came from there and started Zoom. Now, I was the early bird there and I saw WebEx as a business tool as more a tool to see the web to see the web meeting as a war room for the business that was my drive mm -hmm. and then i learned and in bond i 
you see, Lid, what you see when a company I was on that moment, when we did IPO, I had 60%. But on that moment, I maybe the biggest shareholder, but still was 35% or so. But I have a board and management, but management, in my opinion, I have given them too much freedom. They moved more from customer intimacy to MA. And I should say more, filling the pockets with uh, selling divested shares. Now, that is, I make my mistake from in the beginning, uh, focusing on custom intimacy and too much. I was naive and let them go in what I call shareholders value. But mm. then I learned shareholders, there are no shareholders because I did not understand them. I used to call them share movers because no one is holding. And that's the problem. I was so naive, I was thinking these people are for life with me. But no, they're gambling with you. Now, right. That's the element. What you, the challenge with the VCs, etc., is is kind of real, not so attractive for the disruptive innovation. Mm. And therefore, I quit. I quit and and with my WebEx knowledge and top tier knowledge. Top tier was the first uh, uh, XML portal. Later on, I sold it to SAP. We sold it for four hundred million to SAP to replace their Netweaver. Uh, and it was also tremendous technology. I was founded already, but I saw it. It was not complete enough, uh, and and it was not consumerized enough. And then we moved what we today see, like the REST API, like uh, infrastructure as a service, like what you see in a Google, in an Amazon, etc. Now the middleware layer for ERP is thinking. I'm saying often it's not. Mm. It's it, it's it's architectural done by the knowledge of the last century of ERP, but not done with a native cloud. Now, that is what I learned right. to, to start again in the cloud. You, you have to do a totally other way of thinking than in on-premise transactional uh, ERP. Right, and right. Re yeah. Yeah. And realize, Eric, what is everything is stored in the transaction and is stored in concrete. Now, in BPM, the uh, rule, the rules were already decoupled, and one second before the transaction, you could change the rules. Now, an MRP is too much stored in concrete, and and you have no choice. I I put your the process through your throat. Right. That's, that was the biggest say limitation. Is it on ERP? But so far, good enough if it is backend, but not right. good enough if it goes downstream. Right. Right. That's very interesting. I I wish I could say that back in 1998, I too predicted the advent of the cloud, but I did not. I was still trying to figure out what ERP software was. I worked with the guys of I2 also, but they, they were more on the rule engines. Right. Interesting. So so what about um what about Vanderberg, the company you founded, your CEO of a company called Vanderberg right now? Can you what can you tell us about Vanderberg and what are you up to these Vandenberg, days? Uh, in Vandenberg, uh, I saw I had a castle of Vandenberg. It was my uh, uh also my holding company. But then uh, in the mid of when I start, started BPM, we had this BPM layer. And I had even another uh, another investor in it, but I invested something new, what we call the beginning of microservices, mm. and we built it already in in the mid nineties, say in, in two thousand five or so anywhere, and and then my board was a little uh, absolutely a little afraid in what we did, and I decided that okay, let me take it again, and I bought it private back, uh, and I called it to my castle and to my therefore I call it Farnberg, and it was my third startup. Uh, after BPM, we moved then to the second part of the internet. Right, right. And that and was the come... beginning of the beginning even of the workflow. Because right. in, in Cordis, I built silos. Sorry, in, 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 in uh, Bahn, I built silos. In Cordis, I built processes to the, in, to the inbound enterprise. But there is no supply chain. Even today, there's no supply chain because you're not you are not collaborative. You're not dynamic. Now, then we moved to the workflow, and that's the part of the supply chain to the collaborative workflow. Interesting. So, so when you say you built silos at Bond, are you talking about modules? Like it was a module based module yeah, system. Yeah, we did it already. Nice, but the problem is we had a and the good thing is we have unique plant, but no one came there. We had a custom or a decouple point. And in the custom order decouple point, you could decouple everything, every type of uh, engineer to order, make to order, make to stock. And we decoupled it after the warehouse layer on the latest moment. No one did it before. They have mm. given the man the unique element. And we had our dynamic enterprise modeling where you did even the, uh, the implementation stuff on the same element. That was unique. And mm. every component was decoupled. And we built our famous band shell. Now, the bound shell is now still executing an info everything to the internet. 
That means in internet, maybe Info is the only one who takes the same source code, the same functionality immediately in the cloud because they have not to replace the code. The code was executed with a bound shell to CPU, called the CPU now the internet. It was database independent and it was operating system independent, called the operating system now infrastructure as a service. Mm. And they were able to connect it to Amazon like they be before connected to Unix. Interesting. And there is there is info is still amazing today in the and simpler. If this reason I was amazed that my old old bound product is still in the top of the ERP. Now yeah. and it's and it is simpler than Oracle and then uh, SAP to implement the complex uh, variety of business processes in in the enterprise. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it is amazing that the product is still around and a lot of companies still using mm-hmm. using Bond. And I know Infor has been supporting it now for for some time now. Um, yep. So back rewinding back to nineteen was it nineteen seventy eight? You said you started Bond. Uh, yeah. So nineteen seventy eight, you start a company called Bond. Why did you start? Yeah, the not company? Bond, not Bond. I started a consulting company. I was a bookkeeper and maybe a controller. Uh, and I, and then I came by accident in Silicon Valley in in eighty one, eighty two. And I dealt and I, I I was selling already some microcomputers from a company called Durango in San Jose. And then I was I was the first one who sold this uh, stuff. What normally was used by toys, by Apple, etc. They used by toys. We used already an eight bit sixty four k machine in multitasking, multi user in the eighties in eighty two. Now and and then I came at home by the CEO of Durango and the guy saying I'm not going to Unix. I say oh then I have to go to Unix. And then we built our famous bond shell from that moment. But it was always done on uh, uh, I think say. Uh, state of the edge technology the all the other all my competitors like ASK were on minis mm. and we were the only one were on microcomputers and then we adopted the microcomputers we adopt Unix from the beginning like today Linux Unix we never went in .NET I see it Unix I was far more professional on it and Unix have given us all the power to build this stuff like the band shell now mm. we, we were in tools like progress but we are not selling the tools but the tools were integrated by the application developers that was unique elements right. uh, then i moved to india and our real success is that i was already in the mid 80s in india and very soon i had thousand empl- uh, engineers hmm. where 10 years later no one was even there uh, sap oracle they were even in the, in the first 10 years not in india now then there i have in-depth technology with top people i pay them extremely high salary but was in rupees and i was selling the product in dollars and in euros now and i trust them that was also the other secret the secret in bound was that we were more an indian company Mm. and link them together yeah that's super interesting i mean another another uh trend that you saw before the rest of the world did which is which is very um impressive and we're here with Ian Bond talking about the history of ERP software as well as the future of enterprise technology. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. Could you whisper in my ear? If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organisations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 162. My name is Eric Kimberly, here with Darian Fiakuski. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday by going to transformationgroundcontrol.com. You can also listen and watch to past episodes as well, all 161 past episodes. Again, that's at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So I'm excited to continue the conversation here with Jan Bond. 
the founder of Bond Software. We're here talking about the history of ERP software as well as future trends in the enterprise tech space. Let's jump back into the conversation. What we did, what I did already in the eight, in the nineties, uh, aligning IT and business, and we call it boundary spanners. And that was also another secret. Uh, there was a mini MBA where this uh, we call it this green beans. These youngsters were around the world. And we were able, they could do the pre-sales and, and implement this stuff. That was also another element who, and they, they more also were instrumental for this dynamic enterprise modeling and all this stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, a lot of people joining from all of the world here today, uh, everywhere from Spain, Switzerland, uh, Spring, Texas, uh, Koken, India, USA, London, Ontario, someone else from the Netherlands, Paris, India, Hong Kong. Okay. Um, so a lot of people from all the world. world. Yeah, throughout <laughs> the world. You're, you're, you're a world uh, phenomenon. And people want to. Yeah, now with you. Be together. <laughs> yeah, see, so you and I together can get can get a good audience for sure. Um, so one comment here that I, I think is worth uh, noting here. Um, I just lost it. So bear with me. There's so many comments coming in. I'm having trouble keeping up. But uh, indomitable entrepreneur and a visionary. I, I totally agree with that. I think that you've already pointed out two things that you, or at least three things that you're, you're, you're far ahead of uh, your time. On. Get, if you allow me. I disagree with visionary. Uh, we have a saying in Dutch: "Vision is bullshit." Uh, <laughs> you have to learn it. You have to learn it from mistakes. Uh, always, I was traveling on roads uh, where never was before me. But then, what you do, you try to do it first time good, but never was doing. It, it's always failing. You throw right. it away, and that should be done more in in IT. You throw it away and do it again. That means right. vision. Yeah, it's more learning from your mistakes. But right. some people say Jan Baan is learning faster than the competitor can make it. And right. that's the element. If you do it quick and fast, then you have time to do it again. Right. Yeah. And make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Uh, uh, and never, never do it too long because the, 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 big, the most problem you can have is source code. And what we did always, we throw it away, rebuild it for half the, half the lines of source code with two times more functionality. That means I started with 3GL, moving to 4GL, even driven 4GL with Triton. And we throw away all the times every module and rebuild it. And that is what we should do even today. It should be evergreen. Software should be permanently rebuilt on the new technology waves. Right. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, so what about, I'm gonna, and there's a lot of questions coming in, by the way, Jan, about, um, about a bunch of things I'm going to get to here in a, mo a moment, composable ERP, AI, et cetera. So, but before I shift gears and talk about sort of the future of ERP, I want to come back and sort of finish the story here of, of how you've gotten to where you are today. Um, if you're looking, if you, if you look back at um, your, your time in the enterprise technology space so far, um, not just with Bond, but with the BPM company and, and now with Vanderberg, um, what are some of the biggest lessons that you have from the industry and what might you do differently if you could go back and do it over again? Uh, first of all, often you sometimes underestimate yourself and too much. I maybe have given author authorization out of my hands and have given it in the hands of the managers mm -hmm. uh, and they have a different view. Uh, I mentioned already they're looking to the short term. And disruptive innovation sometimes take you 10 years before you're there. And you have to be patient and do it this one. It's perseverance, not give up. And and most go back, customer intimacy is the most important one. Mm. Uh, focus and, and too much I make my mistakes and, and even allow them to go to share all this value and all the other stuff, etc. If greed is drive you, and if it's only the money, then it's even it's not joyful. But that is the most dangerous part in it. And we overestimate because we are only down to earth. We are manufacturers. I learned what I do is a manufacturing process. And not so many people are doing it. I have the bill of material with all these components. I'm composing this one. I learned from Boeing and everything that I have to be like them, a manufacturer. What I did, decoupling, late binding, and all the manufacturing principles. I built that. I call it my own software factory. Now, and that is what we did in India. And again, learn again to go now more to UX and go more to user. We In the beginning, we ignore too much the user. That's the problem. What we see with ERP, it's too much generic. My innovation is what you have to do. But now we move to mass customizing. To some elements, we make it generic, like a mobile. But on the same moment, it's becoming specific. 
and the power is an enterprise should not be the same porter expected that with new technology we can be all different but we all coming the same uh, like fleming in in sap and, and, and in use the same functionality and there's no differentiator now we should destroy this and mm -hmm. we should say uh, take only a generic part like in a car some things are generic but your dashboard is specific and it is a deep couple point and bring mm -hmm. it there that's very interesting so here's a question that sort of builds on something you just mentioned a moment ago, Jan. You, you were talking about how vision, uh, being a visionary is bullshit, and it's all about your 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 experience and lessons from it. Um, but maybe just building on that point a little bit, this is from from Jan on LinkedIn. Jan asks, apart from experience, how do you predict well ahead? What are your sources? So maybe another way to frame that is, are there, are there sort of like academic or just data sources you use in addition to your experience and it's your simple. thought? I said, just uh, be down to earth, just do it, do it fast and do it again and throw it away and again, pick it up uh, because you cannot oversee it. And the problem is what people are doing. They all underestimate, build it and all these uh, elements are in, but go there. First, you have a feeling. Should you go north or south? You have to go north. But if you climb the mountain, you cannot see it. You have to build a camp again. And if you go left or the right, you correct. You have camps, you do something between. Now, what we did was extremely important that also in the uh, in our software factory uh, that we were able to to give, no, let me say, you have the freedom to people. We were saying, uh, I'm dealing with, with intelligent people. It is already a problem uh, because they are not so easy to handle. Now, we learned it's, it's attitude of people. We learned how to make these people more innovative. That's one point. Mm. But then you have another point. If you have innovative people, they're sometimes introvert or sometimes maybe you need a little autistical to understand it. Now, with these kinds of people, you have to go, you have to cross another border, which is not easy. You have to make them also more uh, that they take initiatives. That's the biggest problem. And then people right. are afraid. They say, I have to ask my mother to do it. They say, you have not to ask your mother, you have not to ask your boss, boss just do it. Now, and what I did, I went to all the three people say it is better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. You just do it. No, that means I've given all the guys all the authority in the small teams. Hmm. And, and that was the, and then the third element is an important. Is it me? I know it should be integrity. And that means it should be not done for me, for the team. And then you you have to re, also uh, reward the team and, and share wealth with them that they feel it's all for us. And then one and one is never three. You Americans are always saying one and one is three. I like to have two and you can have one. And then you're proud. No. One and one, in my opinion, is 11. What and bring it in. And the I, it's only done, the core element is only the attitude. Mm. Give totally freedom to your people. Let them go. Don't ask, and then uh, and every moment they share it, and, and it's coming because in the beginning you cannot oversee it. It's nonsense. Everything you like to do in a vision is all nonsense because it's never reality. Right. And, but you learn so much for your customer. That means important is then the customer intimacy part, mm. and even try to have to decoupling generic part and the specific, and then you learn again. Right. In my opinion, more it's more the attitude than knowledge. Right. Yeah. I. Totally agree. You can always find smart people. You can always learn more. That's that's oh, great, yeah. but it doesn't do you any good if you don't have the the right attitude and the the, the humble yeah. the humility to learn from mistakes and that sort of thing. So that's yeah. a, those are great points. Um, so just shifting gears a little bit, and I think you you might have alluded to this answer or to this question already. But what are some of the ERP software and just general enterprise tech trends that you're most excited excited about right now, based on where we are in the industry here in 2024? Yeah. What we see important is uh, still ERP, they call it often the mother of all complexity, it became extremely complicated. And what is the limitation of ERP? It's done in one database, a relational database, with tens of thousands of tables. Sometimes SAP is maybe coming to 100,000 tables or so. It's becoming complicated, complicated, complicated. And then you increase it. Now, then we moved to end-to-end -end processes, and then you do it on the process layer. Now, what we now do is realize that in Kubernetes, in this containerization, you can build very small parts and unite them together. And it is done, and you can do it 100 times faster and better to do this type of stuff. But mm. most people cannot oversee ERP. That's the problem. If you have the kids from Google, have no clue what ERP means. Now, therefore, you have ERP as a given. Okay, use it. 
like the engine. If you see a new car, the engine is good enough. Therefore, today's ERP is good enough for another 10 years if you decouple it. Hmm. Uh, but only take it vanilla, destroy, take the bespoke out, and first start with the bespoke in microservice on the front end. Decouple that. Hmm. When it is vanilla, you can implement it in, 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 in one week for a new version. Now, you see now the Inforce, et cetera, try to come every, like, a, like a Salesforce, every three months with a new version, like a kind of every green. Okay. If when you decouple the bespoke, you adopt it again, and then it's good enough, and then sunset it step by step. And then you bring those processes, you have the most value downstream for the knowledge worker, do this. You make more money to uh, optimize the downstream workflow than to increase the backend. The backend is good enough. Right. But the backend never could do UX. The ideal situation is by ERP that you have no user, one user. There is no UX needed in, in, in ERP. The right. UX part can be, uh, what we say, late binding, uh, can be done in the microservice 100 times better. Right. The middleware fits not. Now that's mate, I learned that, and then yeah. okay, it's not so attractive. Now if you go there, then you can be. With, I admit maybe you could have an element. What we see two elements is service now on the one end, complicated stuff, and SAP the one end. Now maybe you can do it for ten percent of the course with info and, and what we're doing together in this right. stuff. It's, yeah, it's good enough for a Boeing was already good enough. I mean the functionality of the core master production scheduling is still the same. All those complex, all the source code is still the same. A product configurator is still the same. Now, but from the downstream element, let me say from the decoupled point, when it is from a decoupled point going from generic to specific, then the whole project model, project control can be built in microservices. Now, I did it already for a tremendous big automotive company with 22,000 users. We built, a, as a Microsoft killer, we built in a couple of months a totally project module and it's much simpler where you bring everything, the invoice there, and then you offload it. They deal with 40,000 SAP users. Now, and then you, you decouple the project module and bring it more downstream. Now, mm. there is a way of thinking, respect it, and then step by step, send it and decouple it. Right, right. We're here with Ian Bond talking about the history of ERP software as well as the future of enterprise technology. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 162. My name is Eric Kimberly, here with Darian Fiakuski. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday by going to transformationgroundcontrol.com. You can also listen and watch to past episodes as well, all 161 past episodes. Again, that's at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So I'm excited to continue the conversation here with Jan Bon, the founder of Bon Software. We're here talking about the history of ERP software as well as future trends in the enterprise tech space. Let's jump back into the conversation. This is from Kyler on LinkedIn. She says, Eric and Jan, is traditional ERP dying? What are your thoughts? What is, what is dying? It's refreshing. Let's first it's say, refreshing. but ERP, because realize, realize ES, ERP is built in the first IT wave, is the wave of databases. Now, hmm. uh, but ERP should belong to big data. Now, what I'm not doing, I'm not dying ERP, I'm optimizing a little. The old man will, I give them a car or so. That means immediately I take the database of ERP, immediately in BigQuery of Google. Now, that means, and then I can, and, but I have to go, but if you take a process out of ERP, most people do not understand it, the, you should be the finishing element back. Now, what we learned in BPM, if you take something out of ERP, the result for the compliance part should be back. 
Now, there are there are principles, and then ERP can go another 10 years, but never do a big bang. Never. Mm. And, and then it brings all the complexity. But I cannot, I I can't, some, we have the Dutch government, they spend a billion to replace an SAP system. Now, and if you see do all this big company, they pay hundreds of millions. Now, that is nonsense. It could be done for uh, 10 times cheaper if you look to it, if you do it smart. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So you're, is what you're advocating then or suggesting is that ERP, we need to rethink what ERP is. So yep. ERP, in other words, is a back office uh, database uh, transaction administrative, process. Kind of an administrative system. Okay. Okay. So we're trying. And, but, but it's complicated. If But if you if you go to the generic part, the biggest part we built was, say, master production scheduling, but not so many people are using this. But all to, have to understand all those elements, decoupling elements, it's good enough. Because ERP, the data, the latency of ERP, the data, if you have it once a day, uh, it's good enough, but you should pick it as one version of the truth. And that's why people cannot do this. That means if you adopt the work from the front of the front end, you should adopt maybe once a day or once a week an ERP run, a master work scheduling. That's good enough. It makes no sense to have an ERP run every five minutes. No. Right. But, but on the end, we take uh, our IoT sensors and they are they are real time and I take it in a microsecond. No, and mm -hmm. I do this in the workflow. That can be if you do this in ERP is one thousand times too too to complicated. That means mm -hmm. in late binding, you never have to do this type of workflow elements. And let me say this way, ERP is only handle, handling a transactional element. But downstream you have the human and the human have is not involved in ERP. Now, then downstream, you can take in you need state machines and do it. Now, do it downstream. Then you take the human and you combine this one. Mm. It means if the flow, you see it as a car, the engine is below, but you travel there more with, with anywhere, you uh, with Google, where to go there, and it's on your dashboard. Mm. And there you need it every second. Right, right. So can you help us understand then, and, and this is something that you and I talked about prior to this interview, but the difference between microservices and composable systems you, you, yeah. you pointed out that there's a distinction there how would you summarize that yeah. distinction some people say erp is composing can never be composing because there's no human involved mm. erp is only a transaction and if you have no big data you have even no version release control you have only the data from yesterday but not from half a year ago in big data you see all the other elements and you never can make it composing we do it composing you adopt it as the engine and you do it on your dashboard in the microservices but then you need dynamic semantical microservices and then with kubernetes and then the big data is involved everything is google providing me now what i spent hundreds of millions in in the in, in last century in, in the early days to do it myself now you have to understand this but it's all consumerized. The REST API is so much consumerized, or did everything is here. It's so simple to do it here. It's consumerized. And here, this composing. And composing is not need in an enterprise. Composing is always need by the job to be done. Right. See, see, if you do it too early, then you mislead people. Why should you compose when you work with 50 people in a factory in a department? No. It means only when you sell or assemble the product, now, composing is human. Right. And in that human composing element is downstream, is workflow. Right. And some people, they misunderstand the power of microservices. They are strong. The tools in microservices are by 100 times stronger than the tools I built in ERP in, in, in the 90s. Hmm. I mean, I can easily build a, to a, 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 a complete ERP system in a year time. But why should I do it? I can most I can make much more money to let ERP stay in the back end uh, because it's not so improving there so much and 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 added it to the front end. ERP is good enough where it is today. It's people understand the processes. Yeah, they're not changing it. Uh, right. But over time, uh, in, when we go to say three uh, D printing, but it, that failed, uh, then you need no ERP. You need only right. PDM. But maybe over time, but and what we did, we learned e ERP and PDM. Maybe PDM is more becoming more important than ERP to link the design. But you need in the in the microservice, I have to bring everything together. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's super interesting, and that's something I I think is hard to understand in our space because the software vendors 
love buzzwords and so do the industry analysts. And so they'll use words like composable microservices. And they, I hear those used somewhat interchangeably at times. And I think that's, uh, it helps to understand that difference. And And Eric, you know, even more than I know that only a few people understand ERP. Uh, Even for a CIO, it's hard to understand the processes of ERP. They are more, sometimes more CPO, is chief procurement officer uh, than chief innovation officer. And, yeah, and, and that is more the problem. Yeah, it's, and, and over time, IT will disappear and will be part of the business. Yeah. And what I'm doing now, I'm dealing with the business owner and with the business analyst. Immediately, I can generate already 70 or 80% source code in Java. That's what we do in our rapid tools. Mm. I mean, uh, I, aligning IT and business is the core element. Right. And, and 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 then and the, maybe the business uh, engineer only understand the spreadsheet, but they can use the rules already in the spreadsheet. That means, and if I can, with, uh, not with the program, but with with the tools, adopt these rules already. Then even uh, I have not to go over six months back. No, it, the business owner engineers is already responsible for the rules. And other times, IT did not understand. Coming back, there were the problems in the past. Right. You have That's to. Very the only element what you have to do is to simplify. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it seems like too, you know, a lot of organizations are stuck in um, the patterns of the past. So in other words, I have an old ERP system. So therefore I need to replace my ERP system. You know, that's yeah. the mentality you hear. Yeah. Back to your point about chief procurement officer. I think that's- see nice Ellen from Gassel, they say, will Bond be eventually phased out and merged with into Infra? No, I can call it again, Bond. My name is Bond. <laughs> and maybe even we can merge together. I'm still banned, and and I have the right to say banned, but uh, but could be maybe a good suggestion. But okay, right. <laughs> little joke. Yeah. Right, that's a that's a great a great point and question. I was going to show that, and I'm having trouble. There it is. Um, yeah, thank you, Gasan. Great great question there. I have another question that's sort of building on what you just were saying, Jan. I'm going to go find it here in a moment. Um, and that is this is from Cyprian. Cyprian, I hope I'm pronouncing yeah. your name right. Um, on LinkedIn says, what are the key differences between today's ERP and those from uh, both your era, the 1990s? Good, and I know good. you've already talked about microservices no, and cloud. And- question, the difference between the ERP is nothing. And when ERP is going to the cloud, it's pseudo cloud. Realize that the same source code and mm-hmm. even problem, even today, most vendors have less functionality in the cloud than on-premise. And the core fun- and 80%, 70% of the core elements are built in the 90s and the 80s. And are still the same because right. the people today do not understand the source code to do this one there that's the biggest problem and 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 and, and therefore and therefore we have to deal with it but the good stuff is you see the input and the output and with big data if you take the data with big data if you if you adopt there are some things like the containerization and if you bring ai on it then you you then you bring end to end from ERP to the knowledge worker, what it makes sense today. Chat CTP, etc., like Microsoft, they have a, they have a ten petabytes of data, but only unstructured, and they have no clue what ERP means. Mm-hmm. All the ERP data is hidden for Chat CTP. They're more, therefore, they have no meaning, and we overvalue too much AI on this moment as only a suggestion for maybe a, a lawyer or so or something but right. not for an engineer on this moment. We have to right. be serious and there's yeah. something to do. Well, I, I appreciate the fact that you mentioned something I always say, but I, I get a lot of uh, criticism for, which is uh, the functionality of cloud ERP systems is not as strong and doesn't have the same functionality as some of the on-premise legacy systems. Yeah. I say that and the software vendors don't like when I say it, I'm not selling software, so I could just yeah. say what yeah, I mean. Yeah, but Eric, you, you then from the ERP part, because the ERP part is done with the architectural view uh, because they're locked in from the 90s. But if I'm looking where I'm building application in Google, I, they are by far stronger to build every type of application. But mm-hmm. the the knowledge to do this is most times not available there. That means uh, the best people of Google are smarter in gaming uh, and, and all these other elements. Right. But they, but if you use the, the same tools, you can make a five times stronger ERP. But ERP is good enough if you bring it to the end-to-end process, to the workflow. I should say, guys, you all can make a, a fortune of money and the best, a tremendous element for for manufacturing companies if you if we connect the chain. Mm. And if we simplify the ERP part, 
take the customization out, uh, and then even connect other stuff like BPM, do nothing with IoT, do it on the latest moment. If you talk machine to machine, the operation, the, op the operator needs a tool in the workflow and not an ERP. Mm. Now, you make then a mistake. All these people are, are, are building in BAPIs. BAPIs, what, that, what is this? Now, that you have to be very old and, and people to do this. Now, there is nonsense to do this. Right. Uh, you should go uh, take then Java and take then elements in, in, a, in a front end stuff. But when it is done, always every product, even in a Tesla car, you have three technology waves. You have still material, you have electronical, you have software. Now, there's nothing wrong with ERP. It's maybe the old, it's, it's, maybe, it's maybe the engineers, but if you see it as different technology waves in one solution and, and decouple them. Right. We're here with Ian Bond talking about the history of ERP software as well as the future of enterprise technology. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling, and I'm the CEO and founder of Third Stage Consulting. Before we dive too far into today's content, I want to invite you to learn a little bit more about Third Stage Consulting, who we are and what we do. We help clients through their entire digital transformation life cycles, beginning with digital strategy, software evaluation and selection, all the way through and including implementation planning, implementation readiness, and the actual implementation itself. We're technology agnostic, so we only represent our clients' best interests. We do not represent software vendors. But having said that, we work very closely with software vendors, all the leading players that you can imagine we've worked with both in helping clients evaluate and select them, but also in helping clients implement those solutions as well. So we have a very broad objective agnostic view of the market that is meant to really represent your interest as you go through your digital transformation. I also encourage you to scan this QR code right here to get access to our resource center. This resource center has a ton of information, a ton of eBooks that are free. You have access to top 10 software rankings, playbooks for how to make your project more successful, guides to change management, YouTube videos, all kinds of stuff that are going to help you through your digital transformation. So I encourage you to scan this QR code to get access to those resources. And please feel free to reach out to me directly to brainstorm ideas about your project. Even if it's just informally, you want to bounce around some ideas and get some informal advice, I'd be happy to spend some time with you. So feel free to reach out to me. I've included my contact information below. You can also find it in the description field of this video as well. These things take time, mom and dad, they have a good life, but what am I going to do with mine? Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 162. My name is Eric Kimberling, here with Darian Fiakuski. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday by going to transformationgroundcontrol.com. You can also listen and watch to past episodes as well, all 161 past episodes. Again, that's at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So I'm excited to continue the conversation here with Jan Bon the founder of Bond Software. We're here talking about the history of ERP software as well as future trends in the enterprise tech space. Let's jump back into the conversation. Now, now what about this? Here's a great question from Graham on YouTube. Graham says, I'm a little confused regard, regarding Jan's comments on Composable. Can he comment on how best of breed solutions such as Coupa are replacing OEM functionality such as SAP assets? So maybe... You know, how, how is best of breed different from yeah. the other two things composed? We always did, we always did best of breed. And what is best of breed is like a car is the element of decoupling. It's like a bill of material where you have many layers. See the same as a bill of material with many layers. And on the latest layer, you do also more the human part of it. But the best of breed is first is a best of breed of open source components. Now, many are, get, are gathered together with Amazon or with Google. But you have to understand all the other elements. Now they are all. Then we see then that infrastructure as a service is a beautiful layer. Why should you reinvent that? Accept this one, but do then everything in the com consumerized layer over there, and then you see the decouple part. But it's best of breed for me. It's all, also you need a PLM system in a different way. You need other CRM system in a different way. But the problem is they have all the same data structure more or less. Our data from a customer is hundred times stored in all the silos. No, that's nonsense. If you if you, and this and they're all architected in the old way from one database. If you really understand the power of Kubernetes, and then you can do it in very small components, link them together and do the specific ones in every area. My grandchildren are building a show full with, with Lego in one day with all the modern stuff they're in. See it like Lego. Mm -hmm. 
and integrate yeah. them. And then best of breed is only assembling. And in the and take care that you are never have a vendor lock in, and and that you care that you can replace one component to modify another component because that is changing. Right. Yeah. That's that's in really interesting. The vendor lock in is a real risk and a problem, especially when you go back to the procurement comment you made earlier. But yeah, this, but that's the problem. We have people making money. You have no chance. Now, and right. that should be that is nonsense. What we do, we generate everything without a vendor lock in in plain Java. It right. is so stupid, but you locked in. Why are you locked in? These ecosystems from these big ones, these monsters are so big. They're not growing in revenue. They're only growing in EBITDA and in market cap. Why should you pay for, say, 2,000 uh, billion market cap and all this stuff and this old stuff there? Right now, look a little fresh. And then best of breed, you can do much more other things. Right. Here's a thought or a question about the future. Uh, again, this is from Jan on LinkedIn. I, I'm curious to hear what you think of this too, Jan. Uh, but do you think small, innovative ERP producers will win against the larger ones like Microsoft D365, Oracle, SAP, et cetera, in the long term due to faster, flexible ERP modules? Um, yeah. and, I, and I guess I asked that too in the context of you've been through this before. You built a great yeah. product that then got acquired by Infor, which became part yeah. of you know a big machine, yeah. a big software vendor. Do you think that cycle will continue to yeah. where you get these yeah. small, innovative companies that eventually get bought up and become part of that vendor lock-in that you talk about? Yeah, but the problem is, is by the enterprise. The people are too much afraid. Mother may I. I'm not fired by, OE, by IBM in the past. I'm not fired by SAP. And it means no risk in it. And we all are there. And we all are afraid to do some things. No one is eager to understand it. The CIOs are so afraid on average to understand this one because it's new. I don't know what it means. And it's a lack of knowledge. It's so simple, but they're all locked in in this old world. That's the problem. And, and if you look to... Other products, you see small products, small companies, they do a lot. It should be better than to have one company with 1,000 uh, billion market cap is maybe to have 1,000 uh, unicorns around the world. There is, then you have 1,000 times more innovation. Now, but but Nasdaq does, uh, and Wall Street does not like this one because they make the most money in these few ones. Uh, you see only the investments going 60% to four five companies there. Mm, now, right. there is... People are much too looking to save no, because they're only looking to next quarter. No, yeah. That's the biggest problem. Afraid to it. Right. That's very interesting. Uh, uh, the question, how is the rapid developer tool different from low code, no code? Now, let me share there some things. Low code is not the end, beginning of the end of it. There's a big limitation in low code. You cannot build ERP because you cannot do the last mile. Mm -hmm. And there's a problem with low code. Uh, you do very rapid technology for winning their the POC, but the last mile cannot be done and you're limited and you go back to your SAP system. You need not low code, you need smart code. And what we do, let me compare it a little to, uh, to uh, autonomous cars. Uh, uh, we expected already that the cars are autonomous, but still you need a steering wheel on the last moment. The same what we do, you generate a lot, but the perfect is the enemy of the good. On the last moment, you do it by hand. Mm -hmm. You need a tool that you can finish by hand. And, and this is the last element. Now, this combination should always be there. And I think that is the element that low code is more promising than it is in reality, because you often see that you cannot do the last mile and then you're stuck. And you are isolated in another runtime version dependent from your SAP systems, especially. I like more to be everything in one infrastructure as a service than again to isolate this stuff therein. Right. Yeah, very interesting. What about um, one thing that you, you've you spoken about in the past and that you and I talked about a little bit before we did this interview was uh, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. So IAAS and PAAS. Yeah. What, can, what can you tell us about that and how it fits into the overall trends in the industry right now? I see platform as a service like Silver, et cetera, is becoming already a little obsolete in my opinion because it was the first stage of the internet. It's still like a transactional driven system. Hmm. Uh, amazing, you see everything in the cloud, uh, the multi-tenant stuff and all the stuff are good, but you see still, why is it that Salesforce did not rebuild everything in an ERP solution? There, and you see a little the limitation in platform as a service. Now, and then see platform as a service more replaced by microservices. And infrastructure cares now for everything in the cloud. Now, platform as a service was more a mix. You have to deal everything in your own cloud. So have your private cloud, bring everything there together. Now, I have no problem with the guidance. Let the guidance be there in infrastructure as a service. 
but but that you have still a choice that you are not not locked in that you are also there a little um, uh, agnostic to what's going on there but that you control it and the business should control this stuff they're in Mm -hmm. And and uh, and I'm more interested to uh, build there in what we call this micro, but not so many people understand microservice that you can link all stuff together because you have to understand what is real the element of BigQuery. How are you dealing with DevOps and all those elements? Who they are all composed in 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 those elements. Now that's what we built in our rapid development platform. It took me 15 years to mm-hmm. build that. After even uh, I built Cordis. Uh, and, and throw away many times, but you focus more on those elements and you throw away all this infrastructure part. Do it not yourself. You never can do it better than an, than an Amazon, or, or, or especially Google. For me, it's Google favorite by far better than everyone. They control the data. And I'm not so much in favor with Microsoft in .NET in these elements where I see this. I'm not so much liking Office and all the stuff uh, from the part. But okay, that's maybe a little personally where we are going in. Right, right. Now, here's a, that's a great clarification. Thank you for that. And here's a question that's a little different in, a, in something I think is worth hearing your opinion on here. This is from Moses on YouTube. Moses says, what's the outlook for Oracle SAP, here, Oracle and SAP ERPs? As a business system analyst supporting an Oracle cloud implementation, he's interested in cloud AWS, OCI, and SQL. How should he plan his career path? And maybe a general question would be, what, what technologies should younger uh, tech people be learning at the time? What are those hot things that are going to be I really useful? Go there. Uh, some people say uh, fusion. I sometimes say confusion. But if you look to it, we came, we came from the middleware layer. It's more an M&A strategy right. to take everything together. No one is coming out. And you see, and you, and, but they are locked in uh, and they're controlling. They're making a margin. Some people say the mafia is less corrupt than these two ones because the mafia cannot make 90% margin. I saw that in the book, gross margin. They're making 90% gross margin from the maintenance. They say at your service, but on the same moment, they milk you. Mm. Now, you're milked in these monsters. And okay, maybe you need them if you're locked in, but I should say try to escape. If if you do some things, they're in. And this, but first, if you limit it, to only to uh, the vanilla part, then you are not locked in. Never, ever, never do a bespoke element in those tools. Hmm. Use it only when it was corporate, when it was the system. You have no choice to change that. The, the choice was for Oracle. It's, no, it's maybe good enough to do this. SAP is also uh, everything is in, but big. But all the other elements are not integrated. If you look to uh, 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 PQ2Pay and all those elements are M&A components, but mm-hmm. they show it on their, uh, say, their price list as, as, an, as, a, uh, as a totally integrated element. But it's nonsense. Right. Now, do you think, aside from Oracle and SAP as specific vendors, are there certain technologies that you think are going to be the future that, that we should be focused on early in our careers? Uh, I should more focus on downstream microservice element and give it for granted in ERP. And over time, something comes new or some new elements will come maybe over time, but it will take at least maybe another 10 years before uh, this is mature. Uh, See it as a given. But more important is try to understand it. If you understand it, then you have gold. Right. It's better to understand the logic of ERP. Not so many people can do this. We need more people. Uh, it's not so sexy, but try to understand how ERP works. Then right. you enjoy it as the whole manufacturing uh, type of element, the whole how are we dealing with purchase, supply chain, and, and, and deal with this one. Right. Be, more, be more involved in the logic, uh, how it works, and understand it. But it's all done with, uh, yeah, too much traditional elements now it moved to the cloud but if it's go to the cloud it's still in the same principles right right that's a great point we're here with the on bond talking about the history of erp software as well as the future of enterprise technology we've got a lot more to cover but first we're going to take a quick break we'll be back with more transformation ground control
I'm excited to share our newly released 2024 Digital Enterprise Operations Report. This free download is available on the Third Stage website at thirdstage-consulting.com. This report is truly packed full of technology independent and agnostic insights for your project to ensure that you're strategically optimized for success. Download your copy today with the QR code in front of me or visit our website for more details. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 162. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Darian Fiakuski. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday by going to transformationgroundcontrol.com. You can also listen and watch to past episodes as well, all 161 past episodes. Again, that's at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So I'm excited to continue the conversation here with Jan Bond, the founder of Bond Software. We're here talking about the history of ERP software as well as future trends in the enterprise tech space. Let's jump back into the conversation. What about um, open source ERP systems? Does that does that help solve some of the problems oh, or limitations little, of ERP little, systems? Uh, I like even if I look uh, therein, what uh, uh, even uh, going therein. No, I like rootstock. Uh, it was I know the guys very much. It, it's done in a, like not so much done in, in Salesforce, but it's a it's a good element also to see where it is close in some areas to the cloud and do some things. Open ERP is nice if you can use it, uh, but then you have with open tools, the biggest problem is that service companies like it and they charge you more. Uh, why should you make from elements a, a, a mobile yourself? It means in, in some elements, is it then uh, mature enough? But no, in some cases, yes, it can be there, but we have seen that for most people, it was not uh, reliable enough. Mm. Yeah. And it's a lot of, it's a lot to maintain too. It's a lot. Exactly. You, you, yeah. you sort of have the, you're at the Why behest can, of. Yeah. If Infor makes it a little cheaper, maybe they can be king. Right. Right. Um, another question here um, that I wanted to pull up is, um, oh, I lost it. Um, actually, I'll, I'll go to one of the questions I had here um, for, for me, for, for my list. Oh, it's AI. That's what it was. Someone was asking about AI and big data. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on AI and how does artificial intelligence fit into this whole trend of microservices and composable systems? It's very good if we, AI should belong on the latest moment brought in. We, we are making dynamic workflow apps who are based on big data and we adopted all the underlying data end to end. And then we go to a workflow and the workflow is driven by AI. And the AI is in the also in, in Google where we see in Gemini, et cetera, it's all in the infrastructure service layer as uh, as more already uh, as a composed uh, tool, but also I should say uh, as a productized tool. Mm. It's where you see it's all, let's say, productized in an extremely simple way. You can learn so quick this AI stuff on that moment. It's not rocket science longer more. Uh, that means in the beginning we were thinking with IBM and, 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 and AI and we need all this big people. No, you can learn it yourself, intuitive. No. That the, this AI belongs in a microservice on the latest moment because AI, you need it only when the human comes because AI on its own is dangerous. Mm. AI should always be in the hand of the job to be done to execute. And what we do with this dynamic workflow, we facilitate with autopilot, how you call it, you facilitate the knowledge worker to do the job better. Now, now these knowledge workers have to figure out how these ERP systems are working. It should be the opposite. Mm. Peter Drucker expected that the knowledge work can be twice more productive. We are making smart tools to improve the chart driver, to improve the front end, and you make the UI, the UX, especially for the knowledge worker, AI driven. And you, you give them suggestions like in a Tesla car, but on the end, the knowledge worker should drive. Right. AI always should be part of the execution of the knowledge worker, in my opinion. Mm. Right and not lost or buried in a back never. office ERP system. And never do it in the back end because it makes no sense. You right. need it not in the back end. If you see that, see customer or the decouple point, then you, what, you built on, what you built under the hood from a car uh, is different than what you do on the dashboard. Mm. Yeah, AI yeah. is a tool on the dashboard. Right. And yeah, not, you're not, you're not, you're not building in the hood of the car, under the hood of the car. Right. Yeah, great, great point. 
Um, so uh, here's a great question that just came in that sort of tied to it, though. Um, why are we so focused on making the services micro? This is from Niles on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, anyway, how we call it, who made this name and what is the name? I should say what we've seen on the end is ERP was only bringing a product, but now the product becomes a service. And what is in the service? This is then you adopt everything from the product. If you go to a hospital, you see also what, what, what GE is building or Philips is making, then it's coming to the supply chain to the knowledge worker. And we call mm -hmm. that a service. And, and I say, now a service is more, in my opinion, when the human is involved. And, and, and their ERP is becoming more when the transaction when is hidden. You have the trans in the bill of material is maybe the uh, more the latest moment of the bill of material. Right. Where yeah. you bring the service in. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So what, what advice for those listening that are in the ERP software industry or just the enterprise technology space, uh, whether they're consultants or they work for a software vendor, uh, what advice would you give to the overall industry for sort of how to navigate the present and the future first try to understand how the factories are working and understand this one and and then only then you can change no people are now isolated and no idea and then understand end to end and and have colleagues where you can collaborate with this one it's could only small team it's collaborative working that you understand and then tools and then common sense is even more important than tools and then step by step you see you can improve and then step by step you see that new technology can do much more but today new technology is only used for simple products for minimum viable products but realize if you understand this and and then try to have a little uh, architectural it understanding it is becoming part of every business over time we don't need longer it IT should be embedded in the business. We are not doing it for, let me say it this way. Suppose that if a company from $100 million revenue, mid-sized company, and they do $10 million uh, in, in EBITDA, that means, okay, and they have $90 million operational cost. Now, in this company with IT, I can make only maybe 1.5%, it's 1.5 million. Hmm. And I can change a little. But Peter Drucker was saying, listen, this company is doing 90 million operating costs. Maybe 60% is human related. That's maybe 50 million. If Peter Drucker is right, we can do it with half the employees. 25 million can become to the EBITDA. Mm -hmm. That is tomorrow's world. Yeah. Tomorrow, we are using IT only outside. If we use it inside, now we're trading some things you can, and you can ship it here in, in the same day, but the, but the goods are already half a year in a box. That means, but but if those elements are totally united together, all our business processes can be totally different. Now, mm. that is in tomorrow's world. We are in the beginning of, say, enterprise improvement. We call it enterprise. I was maybe a little wrong. I say, okay, joking a little, ERP should not be E. It's not standing ERP because it's no enterprise. And reality is there is no enterprise for ERP. It's only departmental. Mm. It's only a silo. There is an enterprise. But then it's a collaborative enterprise. I should call it, we should build collaborative enterprise apps. Right. To, to collaborate the whole enterprise and to collaborate is the only way humans are involved. When the human is not involved, you can have transactional elements therein. Yeah. Now, it's and therefore, we and don't, what it means. Yeah. And don't, I should say, those in ERP, you are in a lucky position because the glass is half full. Uh, try to escape a little step by step, but try to improve. If you understand it, then you're king. And then you can even go step by step is what going, uh, what can be sunset step, uh, what can be used and what can be built already outside. And, and, and people should have a little uh, to dare to do this. People are so afraid. They are so introvert. Don't be afraid to be fired. Don't ask right. for permission. Uh, just do it. Right. And if you do it, everyone will uh, will offer you a job, right? Because there is so much to do there, right? Now, is that advice for the software vendors, or is that uh, advice that you would also say is well, true the for software CIOs? vendors? You say the problem is a little is uh, is Wall Street, and anyway, I'm filling now my pockets, and what means it, and and lock in. It's not so attractive to change your model when you have this uh, great uh, do no innovation. That is what Pete, but. Uh, uh, Clayton Christian mentioned, we go from uh, predictable innovation to efficient innovation, doing it with half the people and milking the cow, and we are not going to disruptive innovation. 
because mm. that takes 10 years and I'm the CEO of a company and over 10 years my second second uh, follower is there and I have no benefit I'm only benefit from the vested shares now the problem is the top CIOs why should a person by the way make 100, 100 million as an employee employee in it but anyway those guys making extremely big money only from the vested shares tomorrow and they never never will replace ERP mm. why should they do this one because right. We should more open for disruptive innovation. Right. What about for the buyers of technology, people that are the CIOs or project team members that are evaluating potential technology options for their organizations? What should they I know just, or what advice would you give? We know we cannot do the big things, but why are you not doing small proof of concepts and do it with young kids and say, make only small microservices and prove it. And 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 and, and, and t- it's only small ones, and 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 those people can make career in these elements and decouple that a little and do it with people who dare to take risk mm. and to do some things. Young, better the better is sometimes youngsters, and the senior will guide them a little and let the rest let it stay. Don't disturb it because then you have a bore. You have so much. There's so much politics if you look right. to all these layers, and everyone everyone is involved in these money making machines. Right. Now, uh, yeah. Be not slave of that system. Try to be a little innovative uh, and do it small. Think big, execute small, right. and very quick. And what we do often, you do in two weeks, three weeks already. You make a uh, service, and and then again do it. Right. Now, another follow up question along those lines, um, just as sort of a way to close this out. You you made the comment earlier that. Um, CIOs um, feel like they won't get fired or no one ever got fired for hiring IBM or SAP. Yeah. Um, what, what advice would you give to that person that's afraid to do something other than bring on a big, proven, established ERP vendor that everyone knows for yeah. better or for worse? Now, I should say, first, you are too afraid to change because everyone is corporate and everyone's doing, okay, follow it a little, but uh, investigate and do some small elements to prove uh, there, uh, maybe you can go to a PQ uh, to pay. Uh, all those elements who are downstream, take those processes and understand a little microservices. That's the biggest problem also with the big ISVs. The big ISVs are also not understanding. They have thousands of people. They do it in India. They're slaves in India. They're milking the cow here. And they're all part in the system. They are not motivated to go to where you can do it with two people than with 200 people. Hmm. Now, and I should say also expect not too much from these big ISVs. They uh, they are not daring. They're following it. They're all in this monopoly uh, locked in solution. They, in my opinion, they are in danger. Hmm. Why is that? Or where, what do you see happening there? Yeah. If you see the extremely productivity with these microservices uh, compared to what you do in ABAP or so, or what you do in, in, in 3GL type of tools, uh, and with also these tens of thousands of databases and, and link them together. And what you do in, in Kubernetes or in these elements, it is a world of differentiation. Right. And and to your point, you you get a lot of pressure from software vendors who want you to have lock-in. Because yeah, they of course. That and, yeah, yeah. That Fight to it. Uh, act, don't accept lock-in. And by the way, you have perpetual license. You have license for life. If nothing right. changed, why should, you, why should you pay maintenance? Right. If you can decouple it, you need only one user. You bring microservice of it, it's good enough. Now, right. Doc is more better. We should be innovative, like an info or so. Maybe those people can be understand manufacturing. They can, can maybe can be a little more together innovative to combine this type of stuff. They could have already a good starting point. And, and then I should say, ERP could also use in healthcare. The problem, healthcare is more worse. And if you, can, if you understand automotive, you understand everything. Right. That means if you understand. ERP from automotive, you can even go to healthcare, you can go everywhere. And, yeah. and those principles should even, because that is even more worse, uh, even by the government, the ERP principles can even go further downstream and also in this type of industries. Right, right. Yeah, very interesting. Well, I, I really appreciate you you taking the time here today. We are out, out of time. Yes. And, and uh, honestly, my brain is full. I've learned so much in this conversation. My brain can't take anymore. So that's okay. part of why uh, we'll yeah. wrap it up here today. But I do, uh, all kidding aside, I do appreciate you being here today. Um, really, it's a pleasure to interview you. And I, I love having you on. I'd love to have you again because I feel like there's a lot we didn't cover that we could still get to. So if you're ever up for it, I'd love to have you as a guest again in the future. 
Thank you, Eric, and even my, the audience, I really uh, respect the audience. It's nice to talk with all of you around the world, with all those friends where we see those who are in, in, in this world. It's good to have this community. Don't be afraid. Stay down to earth. And maybe it's more common sense. Uh, and it's not and it's not rocket science what we do. Right. It's not so complicated. Enjoy it, and at least yeah. enjoy, enjoy the job, what you're doing. All right, we're going to continue this conversation and build on some of the threads that Jan talked about here, as well as some of the questions we didn't get to. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll cover some of those additional points and questions. We'll be right back with more Transformation Grammar. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Transformation Ground Control, episode number 162. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Darren Felix Kuski. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. And the show is sponsored by Third Stage Consulting, produced by Major Tom Productions. Um, so, Darian, um, what, what were your thoughts and questions and takeaways from that whole conversation? I, I personally loved it, but I'm curious to hear what you think. Yeah, I mean, first of all, what a great person to learn from. I think he has so much knowledge to share, and I love being able to hear all of his different takes and opinions on the past tech space, but also the current space and what's going on with everything. So um, one of the points, I know we talked about AI a lot earlier in this podcast, but I really liked the points he was making about how AI can be dangerous on its own, and maybe we should just have it as a tool on our dashboard and not as the main thing um, that's doing everything. So I thought some of those points and obviously all the other points you were making were very interesting. And I think it was somebody that I can personally, and I'm sure others will learn a lot from, from that conversation. But I think there's some great questions that we can dive in from or dive into from that conversation. So I'd love to just can kind of continue on this conversation. Yeah. Cool. So one conver or one question that I have from this conversation is what IT internal skills should we be sourcing in 2024? Yeah, uh, great question. I mean, I think, um, you know, certainly traditional technologies like ERP and CRM and things of that nature are, are going to be valuable for some time to come. I think we're, you know, a lot of what we talked about with Jan Bon is stuff that's emerging, but the reality career wise might be that you're, you're still kind of focused on where things are today with an eye to the future, of course, you know, what is it that we need to know and learn to be successful in the future. Um, you know, I, I'm still a believer that, you know, technology is going to come and go and trends are going to come and go, but there's fundamental parts of being successful in technology that I think are important, you know, things around program management and understanding business processes. And Jan talked about that too. I think he said something along the lines when I, when I asked him what advice he has for the ERP software vendors and the industry in general, he said something along the lines of go understand factories, go understand how businesses work and focus on the customer intimacy and build products that enable that. And I think that's, it, it sounds simple and you would think, well, of course, I mean, that's what, that's what the industry is already doing, but they're, they're not, I mean, they're building technology um, in a way that they know how to build technology that's built on their platform and architecture, whether or not it's the right fit or makes sense for certain industries or customers isn't necessarily the, the end goal. You know, he talked a lot about shareholder value and he, he mentioned the word greed a couple times. And, you know, he, he's talking about he didn't come out and say it this blatantly, but it sounded like he's saying there's sort of a conflict between um, profitability and economic self-interest and customers actually being successful and getting technology that actually works for their business. And um, he, he also exposed, you know, a lot of the deficiencies and weaknesses of the ERP software space, which I love because I say it a lot, too, but 
you know, because we're independent tech agnostic, we don't try to make anyone happy. We're not trying to make software vendors happy for sure. Um, we're trying to make customers happy and represent what customers' interests are because those are the only people that pay us. I mean, our our clients are the only ones that pay us at third stage, so we don't have skin in the game. We don't care what technology someone does or doesn't use as long as it helps their business. So I, I think that's a, a great point that it brings up is that, uh, you know, we, we have to we have to look to the future of, the, of technology. So if I'm, back to your question, if I'm in the in- industry now and I pick a software vendor that's pretty prominent, whether it's, you know, Microsoft or Oracle or SAP or NetSuite or Epicor and for whoever it is, Salesforce, um, that's great. But I also want to be learning about some of the things that are non-technical that will help me understand technology better and maybe make technology a little more accessible and, and relevant to businesses. And at the same time, maybe pepper in some of those things that he's talking about around microservices and um, architecture, integration tools, um, platform as a service, just you know, really understanding that stuff to understand what some of the options are in the space. And who knows, you know, I think the more, the more you understand broad technologies, the, the more value you can provide to, to uh, customers. Now, the problem with what I'm suggesting is that the way the industry is built is it's built around specialization in certain technologies. And your job is to go deep into that technology and not necessarily ask questions about why or whether or not it's a good fit or whether or not there's good alternatives. Your job is to support that product that you're, you know, whatever ecosystem you're in. So that's the problem, the reality of what I'm recommending. But I do think the more you can broaden your skill set and understanding of the world around you, I think that's going to be super helpful for technologists in general. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And I want to circle back to kind of what I was talking about earlier now um, about the AI conversation. So how will microservices and AI come together? Well, that was really interesting when he he mentioned this because I hadn't thought of AI in the way he described it around the flaw of having AI in your back office system that's transactional and, and whatnot. It's not at the sort of the user facing level. And the whole concept of just behind microservices and the last mile and composable systems and all the stuff you talked about, it, it makes sense you'd want to bring AI to that consumer facing level, the generative AI and all that stuff, which now if you bring it to the consumer facing level, you can use AI and get value out of AI across all technologies and platforms you might be using in an organization. And it's, and it's unrealistic to think anyway that any organization is going to implement one system that does everything. And so you just put the AI model in there and you're good to go. The reality is you have other sources of data throughout the organization. Usually it's multiple systems. Even once you modernize your core ERP system, even then you typically still need multiple systems. Um, for example, even if you deploy S4 HANA, SAP S4 HANA, people think of S4 HANA as a broad, big, massive ERP system that can do everything. The reality is it can't do everything. They also have Ariba, they have success factors, they have Concur, business objects, all these different third-party systems that they bought. So if you deploy S4 HANA, chances are pretty high you also get all these bolt-ons. And if the AI is sitting in S4 HANA, now suddenly you don't get quite the benefit that you might get if, you know, that data, if the AI could, could, could access all that data. Now you could argue, well, you just build integration to the multiple systems and that'll solve it for you. I don't think it really does because it's still AI built for a core back-end transactional system, to his point. It's not AI built for what I actually use on the consumer or on the end user facing side when I'm dealing with my end customers, whoever they are, whether it's a B2B business or B2C or whatever. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And also one question that we got from the audience during that conversation was, I think specializing in any ERP could be tricky. Ideally to be strategic, also AI can take over the specialist roles in in the future perhaps. What are kind of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't know if it takes it over or if it just augments it to where you can go deeper and do more and spend more time thinking and validating versus creating, you know, or or searching for information. Um, so, you know, I guess the jury's still out. I, I suppose there are some roles that could be fully automated or, you know, 90% automated or whatever the case may be, but I don't know that we're necessarily seeing it yet. I think what we're seeing so far is that it's just making people more effective um, they spend less time looking around for information, especially with like generative, generative AI, conversational AI. You can interact with the technology in a way that we never could before. And we don't have to go bounce around different screens looking for a certain field we have to enter to do a search or whatever. We can just ask AI, you know, how many 
what were my sales last month or you know how, how much inventory do I have of this SKU of this SKU in 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 this warehouse right now and it'll just tell me I don't need to go dig around in a system to find it so that's not really make that's not going to automate my job if I need to know that it's just helping me do my job better and it's probably just going to create more of that connection between technology and then the knowledge worker like he talked about you know it's sort of like we're taking the best of humans we're taking the best of technology and we're putting it together better uh, by focusing more on that so that, that'd be my take on it yeah that's a good take and from this conversation Jan and you were talking about the vendor lock um, what are your thoughts about that yeah it's um, that's another thing that drives me crazy about the industry is there's a there's such a profit driven incentive for software vendors and all of their implementation partners and system integrators push the same message which is you need one system you know one technology if you can put everything in oracle or everything in microsoft or everything with sap or whatever um, that's what they want you know it supports their product it supports their ecosystem but it's rare that that really works for end customers and end customers get frustrated by that and it, what's really interesting is with the advent of cloud, I don't, I don't think we've even begun to see the collateral damage that the vendor lock-in is going to cause. Because think about like, a, think about a big company that just spent three or four years going through a massive cloud ERP deployment, and now let's just say they've got maybe not one system, but they've got one core system that's doing eighty percent of their business. So they're pretty much locked in. I mean, it, it'd be, it's going to be hard to rip that system out and just replace it quickly. So. It, what what's going to happen is it inevitably, regardless of who the software vendor is, their customer base is somehow going to outgrow or change in a way that the technology is not. And at some point, it's going to diverge to where there's a breaking point. And, and company A says, okay, we, that software was great for the last 10 or 15 years or whatever it was, but we've changed. We've entered new markets. We changed our business model. Now that technology is not a good fit for us. And so what are you going to do? I mean, how are you going to get off out of the cloud environment? With on-prem, at least you had control of the systems and the data and the applications and all that stuff and the infrastructure. Now you don't. You don't have control over that. Your, your software vendor does. So now you've got to cooperate with your incumbent software vendor now to get all your data out of the cloud and migrate all the business processes and everything over to new technology, but yet you don't have the same transparency, control, and visibility into that legacy system the way you did with your on-prem. So I think the day of reckoning will come, I don't know, maybe it's five or ten years from now where you're gonna have, I, th I think there'll be big problems with companies that are trying to migrate away from a cloud solution to another cloud solution. Yeah, that makes sense. And what do you suggest for companies that may be in that situation in the future? Well, I, I'd say that, you know, it starts now with thinking and, and assuming that there's a high likelihood that you won't use the software forever, because you probably won't. Um, and so you think about, when you think about it in that context, not that you want to create doubt in your organization and start questioning, you know, why are we deploying the software in the first place if we're not going to have it forever? That's just reality. Most organizations aren't going to use the same system for more than maybe 20 years. And if you get past 20 years, you're, you're, you're probably hurting at that point, as we see with companies now that are on systems from the, you know, 90s and early 2000s. Um, so what I'd say is you've got to think like a company that's probably going to need off that system at some point. And so when you go into contract negotiations, you have to think long term. You have to think about not just what am I getting now, how am I going to deploy the software, which is where most people myopically focus. Now we have to think about how am I going to get out of this contract someday? How am I going to get my data out of, the, out of the system someday? What intellectual property do I own versus the, versus the software vendor? You have to think about all that stuff assuming that you're going to have to get out of that contract someday. Um, and also, you know, there's the cost implications too. You have to look at those escalators and the, the kick-ins because that's a thing with cloud that's really costly that gets overlooked by a lot of organizations is that vendors oftentimes contractually have the right to increase costs, you know, at, at, at a highly accelerated rate. Uh, they have the right to change terms and conditions unilaterally based on the agreements you sign. So you really have to make sure you, you have an attorney and, and a team of advisors that can think that way. They can think about the worst case scenario and the likely downside of what you're entering into. And uh, someone that's been on this show a few times now, his name is Marcus Harris. He's a, an attorney that focuses on enterprise uh, technology, ERP. He does a lot of cloud software negotiations, contract negotiations. Negotiations. If you search, uh, even just search this podcast for Marcus Harris, you'll find three or four episodes at least that he's been on where he talks about some of those things to be aware of. So I'd, I'd go check that out or, or just Google Marcus Harris, look him up on LinkedIn. He's got a YouTube channel too. Um, get in touch with him because he's a good person to help advise you through that process. 
Yeah, that's some great tips for companies. And I want to go back to the conversation with you and Jan now. Do you agree with him that ERP software vendors are going to be in trouble in the future? Uh, yes, I do, actually. Um, I do, but they might be able to buy their way out of trouble. Um, and that's and I, I and so let me back up and explain the first part. I think that not just what Jan talks about, but just all these different emerging trends in the market, whether it's AI, whether it's uh, microservices, composable, open source, um, even custom development. There's all these different um, technologies and trends that could potentially disrupt and will likely disrupt big ERP vendors. And I think it's a bit of a house of cards in some ways that I don't think these big ERP incumbents can hang on to their dominant market share forever. And you already see it starting to get, they're, they're starting to get, um, you know, some of that chipped away by, by different um, software solutions. And all you have to do is look at, look at some companies that have already done this, that have already sort of disrupted the ERP space, like Workday, for example, or um, Salesforce is another one. Those are two more established disruptors to the market. And what I think you're seeing now is you're seeing the whole Workday and Salesforce phenomena, which, you know, they came in and did something better than the ERP systems can do because the ERP systems can't be everything to everyone. So they go expose the vulnerabilities and build an entire product, an entire company just around that. And it's a threat to the big ERP vendors. But what also happens, and back to the caveat I said, which is they might be able to buy their way out of it, is that then you look at, well, let's use success factors as an example. Success factors is an HR technology that was very disruptive because a lot like Workday, they went in and provided human capital management solutions better than most of the ERP vendors could. And they highly, it was highly disruptive, but then guess what? SAP bought them. So now success factors is part of SAP. So they're part of the machine. So, you know, I don't know, you know, if we continue to see that cycle uh, unfold, I don't know that you can go buy up and integrate and sell, you know, and, and sell joint solutions or combined solutions. I don't know if you can go through that cycle fast enough with how fast technology is changing. Maybe it worked 20 years ago, 10 years ago, but going forward, I question whether or not the big incumbents will be able to buy up the small innovative companies fast enough. And even if they could, they're not going to be able to get them all. It's like whack-a-mole. There's just going to be more startups starting up all over the place. So I don't know, as long as private equity is around and entrepreneurs are around, I think they're going to continue to chip away at the, at the market or at the, the incumbents. Yeah, that makes sense. And while my brain is full from today's discussion, learning from Jan and you, uh, it was great today. So lots of great talking points. I'm sure the audience feels the same way. Yeah, I'd love to hear the audience comments too. What are your thoughts on trends in the market? You know, things that Jan talked about, uh, some of the follow-up we talked about here. I'd love to hear just your thoughts on where the, the industry is headed, especially if you're, you know, if you're, if you're not working for a software vendor and you're sort of outside looking in, you might have a different perspective or a unique perspective. So I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments there. So uh, my brain is full as well. So with that, uh, we're out of time too. But in addition to my brain being full, uh, and your brain being full, Darian, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up this episode. But I want to thank everyone for being here today. Thank you for co-hosting with me, Darian. And uh, be sure to check out new episodes every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. You can also learn more about Third Stage Consulting. That's the sponsor of the show, as well as the company I work for, uh, you can learn more about Third Stage at thirdstage-consulting.com and be sure to follow us on social media. Follow me on social media as well. So hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week on Transformation Ground Control.